week at the last count, there was something like 500 million cars on the road worldwide. And of course, the car industry, it's going through a bit of a change with the electric car going through hybrid vehicles. But of course, they're not the only choice. I mean, you have some, shall we say, sensible options like the hydrogen car to some slightly more off the wall suggestions like the ammonia car and the chlorine car to some of the more wacky suggestions like the cars run off water. There's been a whole range of things. So I thought we'd have a look at those things, starting with why the electric vehicle died, why it's back. Then a bit of a chat about the water car. Anyway, let's have a look at that. So if you say first electric car, most people are going to think straight away of Ford, but that wasn't until 1913. Now, sure enough, Ford was a great innovator. I mean, he came up with the hemp car, for instance, and he was working on an electric car, but it was actually something like 85 years earlier that the first electric vehicle was invented, and that was by a Scotsman called Robert Anderson, who basically strapped a motor onto a farm carriage and drove it around for a bit, but it was proof of principle, then it was taken up a year later by another Scotsman, Robert Davidson, who created an electric locomotive, locomotive he called the Galvani. Now it's a bit of a beast weighing six tons, able to do four miles an hour and travel about a mile and a half. And that may not sound great by our standards, but by the um, standards of the day, it was something of a landmark event. Now, the trouble these early electric vehicles had is the same trouble electric vehicles have now, and that was the battery. They had to use non-rechargeable batteries because the rechargeable battery didn't come around until 1859. And it was some 30 years after that when William Morrison of Des Moines, Iowa, created the first practical electric vehicle. Now, it was a front-wheel drive. It did about, uh, had about four horsepower, 20 miles per hour as a top speed, 50 mile range, and took about 24 batteries to run it. And it was a huge success of its day. People absolutely loved it and, and it gained popularity so much so that in 1899 it was preferred over the current petrol and steam vehicles that were available, mostly because it was dead easy to drive, didn't have to crank it, it didn't shake you to pieces, you didn't have to fire up the boiler, and it wasn't smelly. So electric cars were hugely popular at the turn of the century, and by 1900, something like a third of all cars on the road were in fact electric. And there was a wide variety of models available to suit every particular taste. Now, 1901, uh, William McKinley, who was the US president at the time, was touring in Buffalo, New York, when he was shot. He survived the shooting and was taken to hospital by an electric ambulance. He later died because of uh, gangrene, actually. It was also in 1901 when Ferdinand Porsche was working on the first hybrid, which he called the Lona Porsche Mixta. It wasn't until 1908 that the Model T came out, and that's often a thought to be the thing that dealt the death blow to the electric car, but the death blow to the electric car at that time is in fact a little bit more complex than that. Now, as I said earlier, the problem with electric cars was the battery, and the only thing available at the time was the lead acid. Now, Thomas Edison and um, Henry Ford were, in fact, neighbours, great friends and neighbours, and they had a faith, certainly Edison did, that the electric car was going to be the vehicle of the future, and had a commitment to this as well. Recognising clearly it was a battery problem, of course, Edison did all of that work to create the nickel-iron battery. The nickel-iron battery is superior to the lead-acid battery in many ways, with one exception. And that is, it has a relatively, or at least Edison's, had a relatively high internal resistance. That becomes an issue later. But, Edison and Ford, side by side, decided to create a popular electric vehicle that would be the people's electric vehicle in the same way that Ford created the Model T. It was in 1913 that the Edison Ford electric car prototype was finished and it still had that essential problem. That's where we get to and that's where people think the electric car came from and of course 
it didn't go any further, and there's a lot of reasons why. Because, let's face it, one thing we love is a conspiracy, because in 1914, Edison had a fire in his workshop, and it almost completely destroyed the project. But if you look a little bit deeper, you'll find that although Ford invested something like one and a half million dollars, and that's dollars at the time then, so obviously a hell of a lot more now, he invested one and a half million dollars into the battery project, and is rumoured to have bought 100,000 batteries, nickel iron batteries from Edison in preparation for making the electric car. And then there's also rumours that the batteries didn't work because of the high internal resistance that I mentioned earlier, and in some cases the car couldn't run on the nickel iron batteries, even though the nickel iron batteries had charge. Then it's said that Ford demanded his money back, and Edison said, money? What money? And they had this serious falling out one of the reasons for the death of it. The other reason that's often put forward as a conspiracy theory is that mysterious fire was in fact started by the oil cartels who wanted to kill the electric car. Now, to my mind, it's more likely that the steam cartels would do that, uh, but that is thought to be one of the reasons. And the other, of course, is the electric starter was invented around about then. So the Model T had to be cranked to start it in the, in the first instance. But with the new starter, electric starter, it was much, much easier to start. And of course, Ford reached his million uh, car sale in that same time. And it's thought that he just got other projects that took him up. So the death of the Ford Edison it's going to be a mixture of one of those. You can take your pick at which particular theory you like. However, it was in the 1920s when our crude oil was discovered in Texas, and that made oil incredibly cheap. And of course, with the spread of roads and filling stations, no serious competition and lack of mileage from electric vehicles, the petrol vehicle began to dominate the scene. So over the next 30 years, it all became rather cheap, convenient, accessible, and easy. So why change if it's not broken? And suddenly we have this dominance of the petrol car around about the 1950s. And one thing that I'm always struck by is the speed of this change and how quickly you get used to it. The 1900s and 1920s, you had very little cars to lots of cars. 1920s, 1950s, it's only 30 years you get the dominance of the petrol automotive. And of course, around about 1968 to 1973, we had the oil crisis, and of course suddenly there was all this queuing and rationing of petrol, and that brought the electric car back into people's minds. And you see if you review everything, particularly General Motors, how much work they did on the electric vehicle. Because it's now sat still for about 50 years or so, so the technology is really underdeveloped, whereas of course petrol has had all of that innovation, all of that effort put in into improving it, and so you've got better cars, better handling, better mileage, all that sort of thing going into petrol, and poor old electric cars are still basically a motor strapped onto a farm carriage. Now all of the focus that the oil crisis brought up did come up with some really interesting things like the zinc chloral hydride battery by GM Motors, which I'm a particular fan of. And of course, the NASA Lunar Rover was an electric vehicle, and this pushes it forward in people's minds and the way that people in the market are thinking. But it really wasn't until the 1990s when the Prius came out that people started getting smug about the whole thing. Incidentally, the Nissan Leaf came out at the same time, and of course, with the Leaf being zero emissions, it got an awful lot of support, and it's a big industry, so governments would pay for assembly of the Leaf. It was in 2006 that Tesla came out with his first sports car to be an all-electric car, and all of this is what brought the EV back after its supposed death. Now, I don't seriously think that the electric car died because of some grand conspiracy. I think it died because of the same reason lots of things have died. People just don't buy them. There was no interest in it. People didn't buy it, and of course, it died. And they didn't buy it because there was a cheaper, easier, more convenient, more reliable solution that they went for, and that was the petrol car. Now, of course, with rising fuel prices, interest has soared. And that soaring of interest has led to an interesting thing. The interesting thing is the support of governments for it. Now, governments don't do anything for our benefit. 
and they do things for themselves more often than not and pushing electric cars is one of those sneaky policies that makes them seem like they're doing something and all they're really doing is pushing the responsibility out onto somebody else because electric cars believe it or not do nothing for environmental issues and climate change there are so many issues in those terms around electric cars it's mind-boggling for instance slave labor in um, where the cobalt comes from because batteries don't generate electricity they need charging and that charge has to come from somewhere it, where it comes from is the power plant if we suddenly have a whole load of electric cars we're suddenly going to need an awful lot more power plants and of course most of those run by burning coal or gas so it's going to push up the emissions of um, power plant production and reduce the emissions of cars with a net impact of more or less zero which is disappointing when you think about it but putting it under the badge of climate change makes it seem like the governments are doing something and so they're pushing it they're pushing it because they can meet their agreement accords without actually doing anything which is great when you think about it but that to my mind is why electric cars died and equally to my mind why they're back they died and they're back for exactly the same reason consumer interest we didn't buy them so they died we want to buy them so they're back and that's pretty much all there is to it it's to me love them or hate them electric cars are in flux they're not the surefire winner that everybody thought they were going to be particularly when you read reports about how much they cost to maintain that the fact that electricity prices are going up so high means they're not as cheap to run as everybody thought they would be they don't retain the value and the insurance is ridiculous the infrastructure still isn't there so charging them is an enormous problem whatever you think about that whether you agree with that or disagree with it i still think it indicates that electric cars are not the answer that we thought they were going to be and in fact Japan hates the electric car or at least it's an argument that could be made that that is the case because they're putting a lot of effort into hydrogen and of course hydrogen has its own problems I mean you're thinking about things like how it's made how it's transported and how it's stored being challenges for hydrogen cars so what I've got here is some concentrated potassium hydroxide. It's five molar potassium hydroxide solution. And I've got a little bit of aluminium foil. And if I drop that aluminium foil in there, we give it a little bit of time, the oxide will burn off and it will begin to bubble and fizz. Okay, so you should be able to see the fizzing around there, around the aluminium. And if I push it down a little bit, there we go, it's going a little bit crazier. All of that is bubbles of hydrogen. And this is a chemical way of producing hydrogen. And as that gets going, it fizzes more and more, producing more hydrogen. Now, this is called Uyeno's method, and it produces a particularly pure hydrogen. It also produces a potassium aluminate. So the potassium hydroxide and the aluminium are consumed, hydrogen is re released, and potassium aluminate is dropped to the bottom, and that's what the reaction does. Now, there's also a couple of other things. That not only do we get the production of the chemicals there and the hydrogen that we might want in order to burn something off, there is also a current formed and heat. Okay, so what I've got here is a stainless steel pot with the same potassium hydroxide solution in it and a little piece of aluminium. The aluminium is clipped to a motor and the other side of the pot is clipped to the motor as well. So the two electrodes are the sides of the pot and the aluminium. Now, if I dip that aluminium in my potassium hydroxide solution, and give that a chance to get going. There we go. We are now producing electrical energy. And it produces a fair amount of power, actually, depending on the amount of surface area of aluminium that's exposed, the thickness of aluminium will give its duration, and, of course, the surface area of the corresponding electrode. Now, at the same time as producing that electrical energy, it's also producing the hydrogen, and it produces a considerable amount of heat. There's only a couple of little drawbacks about it. 
Uh, one is the reaction product is obviously potassium aluminate, so it consumes both the uh, uh, aluminium and the potassium hydroxide, so you'd have to be continually refreshing it, because if you're refreshing it, then what you're doing is filling a tank, you'd have to have some method of emptying it, some method of collecting the hydrogen, which is not too difficult, some method of continually recharging it, that is chucking in more cans that are electrically connected so that you can actually uh, connect the current out, and then handling concentrated potassium hydroxide solutions, because the Yenos only works with concentrated hyd uh, potassium hydroxide solutions, actually they work with sodium hydroxide too. So there's a few problems with it, but as a springboard into an idea, I think it's really, really excellent. Now, there are quite a few patents kicking around, and there was a guy called Francois Cornish who came up with an adaptation of this that I thought was absolutely fascinating. It was patented in 1987. He did some work with BMW on it, so proof of concept and proving that the concept actually worked, and BMW ran a two-litre car on it, he ran a motorcycle, uh, and it came out of patent in 2004 uh, for fee-related issues. So the patent is an expired patent, so it's actually sitting there ready for anybody to have a look at it, should they want to look at it. And the patent number is uh, US Patent 4702894. Now, the mechanical apparatus that he suggested looked like this. And there have been uh, replication attempts at that, and here's one of a replication attempt. I find that exceedingly interesting because he used water. So that was a tank of water with a reel of aluminium wire. He passes a current through the aluminium wire, high-voltage current, which, from which he gets a, a, a high-voltage coil and distributor, to spark that wire. That spark of the wire between that and a rotating drum knocks off all the aluminium oxide, heats up the aluminium tip and exposes fresh aluminium to the water. So the uh, reaction product of that aluminium oxide, which sinks to the bottom of the tank, and pure hydrogen, and that hydrogen can be drawn off. Now, the experiments that BMW did show that this actually works. What was claimed that on 20 litres of water and one kilogram of aluminium, your average 900 kilo car would run for something like 400 miles. Now, that does seem like a lot, but certainly BMW are very interested in it. It's just that the disposable of the aluminium oxide was a bit of an issue for them. The inventor actually just disappeared, but this idea came out again in 2005 with an Israeli-based company called Ingenuity, and they did a funding round in 2007 to raise $2 million to carry this idea further, hoping to create steam and hydrogen to be able to run a vehicle. And of course they brought their own patent out on it, expanding it from just aluminium to aluminium and magnesium. But, but it also didn't go anywhere, which seems a real shame, because it looks like the perfect system for a car, particularly for a hydrogen on demand car, because you're only using water and aluminium, and your waste products are either aluminium oxide or magnesium oxide in a pure form that is easy to recycle back into the metal, and at one time it had the support of a serious car manufacturer in terms of BMW. So why it's gone nowhere, I don't really know, but it does look like the perfect system to pick up and to be able to experiment with, maybe turning it into a home generation system, or maybe looking at it as an onboard hydrogen generator for a hydrogen on demand car, for which it would be a perfect solution. This is the X-15. It was a hypersonic rocket-powered aircraft operated by the United States Air Force and NASA throughout the 60s. Three were built and flew 199 test flights, the last one being on the 24th of October 1968. It was designed to be dropped from underneath the wing of a B-52 and was truly a marvel of engineering. It set all kinds of records that it still holds, including being the fastest aircraft ever built, reaching Mach 7, and exceeding the FAA definition of space, that is, it went higher than 100 kilometres above the Earth. But despite its achievements, what truly interests me are the engines. To achieve their remarkable performance, they ran on a fuel you probably would have never have thought of, and that is ammonia. Now we all know ammonia, it's that really stinky cleaning product, but that is 35% ammonia in water, and of course doesn't burn. But pure ammonia does burn, and it burns into only nitrogen and water, so no CO2, and it's been used as a fuel before. The Belgians used it during the war to supplement their own reducing fuel stocks to run 
public transport, they put it into buses. And of course the US military looked at deploying ammonia generating plants at the front line so fuel could be produced at the front line rather than having to risk transporting it with all the dangers and costs involved with that. And in 2007, the University of Michigan drove an ammonia fueled car across the USA. It's also a very serious contender for powering large ships and container ships instead of diesel engines. Ammonia is a really interesting material for fuel and fuel transport being relatively inert unless you really go about setting it alight. And there are uh, plans in Australia to create a solar energy farm that uses the energy from the sun to create ammonia and then ship that ammonia to different parts of the world where it can be electrolyzed back into hydrogen and so becomes safe hydrogen transport. But of course, the problem with it is the one that I just mentioned, that you have to work a little bit out it to get it to burn. In fact, you add what's called a promoter. The X15 promoter was liquid oxygen, but Liquid nitrogen would do exactly the same thing and only requires 3% addition of hydrogen into the ammonia to make the ammonia burn as quickly as an ordinary fuel. As ammonia isn't a harmless chemical, it's actually pretty nasty. In concentrated form it will attack zinc and brass and plastics so you can't put straight into a car and of course as a gas it combines very readily with moisture, including your tears and your lungs, to form ammonium hydroxide, which is incredibly caustic and can give very nasty burns right up until death. So ammonia, or handling ammonia, is one of those things to press that has been left to the experts, mostly because it will meet the greenhouse gas emissions easily without us having to change our energy infrastructure. Because of course, the bulk of our energy infrastructure at the moment consists of burning hydrocarbons. If we can use those hydrocarbons as a small percentage into ammonia to burn the ammonia, then we can reduce emissions without having to spend massively on the infrastructure for the energy generation that we've got. And when you put those two things together, of course, it means that it's been confined to heavy industry, big power generation and shipping, that sort of thing. And of course there's an awful lot of research and pilots going into looking at exactly this task because of the benefits of ammonia. But of course ammonia can be burnt in an internal combustion engine. It's been shown by the Belgians and by um, the University of Michigan and a whole host of other people the issues around ammonia and ammonia use are to do with the dangers of ammonia. But because danger is one of those relative things, I mean, without a doubt, filling your car up with a highly explosive mixture and dashing around at 70 miles an hour is not the safest of things to do, but we do it readily because we're used to doing it. If we can adapt that so we have the same safety with ammonia, then running ammonia on an internal combustion engine is a very doable thing because they will run an internal combustion engine. Now with all of that in mind, it was perhaps only a matter of time before somebody brought out a production vehicle using ammonia. And GAC, which is the Chinese state-owned motor manufacturing company in association with Toyota, have done exactly that. They've created a two-litre version saloon. It's four cylinders, 161 brake horsepower, and more significantly claims to reduce emissions of up to 90%, so it's only 10% of an equivalent car. Now, there are issues with ammonia. It's something like a third to half the energy density of hydrocarbons, so you're going to have to have a bigger tank. And it's certainly not the first of its type, but it is the first production vehicle of its type that is set to seriously challenge electric vehicles. What they say is that they've overcome the pain point of ammonia use, whatever that means, because the company is being very close about the engine, which is no real surprise when you think about it. But the demonstrations in Massachusetts and in Iowa, and in the trucking companies in Canada, is showing that ammonia as a viable alternative fuel is gaining ground rather rapidly on electric vehicles. And ammonia, of course, has an infrastructure already in place for production and distribution. We produce 
millions of tons of it, mostly for fertiliser at the moment, but that infrastructure is already there and could overcome the problems that electric vehicles are having with adoption in terms of range anxiety, the infrastructure for charging points, the way batteries are made and how they're disposed of, all that sort of stuff, and the fire hazards associated with them. So when you read the automotive press, what you'll find is that ammonia cars are being hailed as the likely end of electric vehicles. Now, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but it is certainly an exciting time to be living in with all these alternative technologies coming forward to deliver power without greenhouse gases. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, electric cars were a pretty big deal and that was because it was the fuel crisis. Well, Gulf Western brought out an electric car with a new kind of battery using zinc and chlorine. Actually, they produced two. One was meant for electric vehicles and the other was meant for home storage. The big deal about zinc and chlorine is it can have up to six times the energy density of lithium. And that got everybody excited and actually still gets everybody excited. Now I'm going to show you Gulf Western, or rather a bit of Gulf Western's video where they explain how the battery works. I thought about redoing it, but actually it's a pretty good explanation if you can forgive the fact that it was made in the 80s and it's always got a bit of pop music over it. Even so, it's a very good explanation. And from that, we'll look at where those batteries are now, because of course having that kind of energy density means they're extremely interesting to people. The principle of zinc chloride electrochemical coupling had long been known, but no one knew how to store the chlorine safely. GNW's discovery was the key to making the system viable. The breakthrough was achieved by storing the chlorine as hydrate, Cl2-8H2O. Chlorine hydrate is an ice-like material in which eight water molecules surround each chlorine molecule and insulate it safely. It freezes at a relatively high temperature, 48 degrees Fahrenheit, and decomposes slowly. Here's how this system works. Each unit consists of two chambers, a store, and a cell. Is totally sealed. And all parts requiring maintenance are on the outside. Each full-sized unit contains 60 cells, holding 4,002 graphite plate electrodes. Half of these plates are alternately spaced zinc electrodes, and half are alternately spaced chlorine electrodes. Importantly, because the zinc chloride system has no active materials in its electrodes, it does not consume itself and deteriorate as do the lead acid and zinc nickel oxide systems. In a fully discharged unit, the electrolyte, a solution of water and zinc chloride salt, is held in the cell and the store. To charge the unit, a pump motor circulates the concentrated electrolyte from the store to the cell chamber. There, the zinc in the solution is attracted and deposited onto the zinc electrodes. The chlorine in the solution then escapes as a gas and is pumped into the store, where in mixture with water from the diluting electrolyte, it is chilled and forms frozen chlorine hydrate. This circulating process continues until all of the zinc is coated on the zinc graphite electrodes and all of the chlorine mixed with water is frozen in the store chamber. The remaining warm water from the electrolyte is held in the cell chamber. The entire process requires six to eight hours for a 100% charge. To produce electricity, the warm water in the cell is pumped into the store where it gradually melts the chlorine hydrate. This melted hydrate is circulated into the cell where, as it passes through the graphite plate electrodes, the chlorine gas, which is like carbonated gas in soda water, is released from the hydrate and combines with the zinc on the zinc graphite electrodes. This coupling produces electricity at the system's terminals. Then, the used, coupled zinc chloride falls back into the circulating solution in the cell, reforming the zinc chloride electrolyte in ever-increasing concentrations until the chlorine hydrate has been completely melted. When this occurs, 
the system has delivered its full charge of electricity, and the electrolyte is once again a 100% concentrated solution. So a pretty slick and elegant system with a fairly impressive chemistry. And as I said before, this is supposed to be six times what lithium has at the moment. And you might ask yourself, well, given that the US government invested something like $15 million at the time in it, which is a small fortune, what happened to it? And the first thing you might wonder is, well, was it the chlorine? Because, of course, chlorine is pretty hideous stuff and was used in the First World War to dramatic effect. But studies were done and it was shown that the chlorine in fact even in the collisions wasn't the real issue. The real issue was the battery only held 35% of the charge that it was supposed to have and it was difficult to recharge. You need a technical crew to be able to do that and of course that really at the time sounded the death knell for that particular battery. However, as I've said, it is such a promising chemistry, as are lots of these types, like bromine and iodine, which are included in chlorine batteries because they're all halogens. These kind of batteries hold great promise, and of course chlorine, as a battery, has been revisited many times, and this storage of the chlorine is also being looked at. And it was in 2021 that Stanford released this news release. Now they used sodium or lithium as the metal instead of zinc, but what they did was tackle the chlorine storage problem. They coated the cathode in a microporous carbon, an activated carbon, and what happens is the chlorine gets stuck in the tiny pores of the carbon, and this will happen with any halogen. Bromine does it, and iodine does it as well. Tackling that problem meant that the chlorine was there, it didn't have to be pumped around or separately stored, and so it speeded the whole process up and made for a very much better battery. But then, in 2023, this paper came out. What it did was coat the cathode, the carbon, with a layer of manganese dioxide. And it turns out that manganese dioxide will assist with the actual reaction. It makes it much quicker and much more complete. And so we're upping the energy density. And they went back to zinc in that paper. So the zinc and chlorine battery really took a huge leap forward. Because if you think about the structure of the zinc chlorine battery, what it is really is what's called a flow battery. Instead of having all of the materials in one place and charging and discharging it, you keep them apart and then you pump them into the chamber where you want them to react. And that's the characteristic of all flow batteries. And that structure of a zinc chlorine flow battery has been taken up by this company, Nano Flow Cell. Now the car's been in development for some time, but it was only two months ago that they announced that they were ready to rock and roll and begin production in the US. The claims are pretty grand. They say that it runs for about 2,000 kilometers or 1,200 miles between top-ups and it has something like 600 watt hours per kilo energy density, which is pretty cool. They also say that it runs on nothing more than salt water with a special additive they call the bi-ion. Now the bi-ion is likely to be a little bit of BS, maybe there's a bit of chemistry behind it, but the telling thing is the salt water, which is sodium chloride. So they're clearly using some kind of flow battery that's related to the zinc chlorine battery, and it's now, like Stanford, a sodium chlorine battery. Whatever you think about the Quantino, of course time is going to tell whether it actually works or not, what it shows is that this idea of a chlorine battery, far from being a dead idea, was first developed in the late 70s to early 80s, has gone through a whole load of progressions, and now a version of it is appearing in ready-to-produce cars, which is pretty exciting stuff and holds up that idea that using chlorine for your reactant is very doable as long as you rethink some of the ways of doing it to make it safer and better, which certainly seems to be being done. And it's a question of really watch this space because just like replacing sodium or lithium with zinc has been done, the next iteration of this, I wouldn't be surprised if they're back to zinc and chlorine with some combination to improve the reaction kinetics, that's make it faster, improve the amount that it can actually charge and discharge by, and improve the chlorine safety. Those look like they're being done, very much like they're being done, in which case we could well see the zinc chlorine battery right back there, or maybe, given nano flow cell, 
That's exactly what we're seeing. Wind power is actually a super interesting thing and of course it's been used for centuries when you think about boats but people obsess about cars and wind power cars equally have been around for a very long time especially if you think of things like land yachts. Now the Greenbird won the land speed record for a wind powered car in 2009 and it used a fixed wing instead of a variable wing and this was followed up in 2010 by the Blackbird which created a car using a propeller that went faster than the wind. Of course this created great excitement in people and I've no idea why because boats have been doing that since they invented the Latin sail. To do it on land didn't seem much of a challenge to me, but it was done and everybody was impressed by it, me included. These vehicles though are designed to go as fast as possible in a straight line and of course that's a limited amount of use when it comes to doing something like a real car that's got to turn corners and go around streets. For something like that you probably need a rotor that can take the wind direction from any direction. A propeller blade is going to be able to take the wind only only from straight behind or straight on. A sail can take it in degrees of where the wind is blowing and a rotor like a Savonius can take it from any direction. So I had a look around and I put this together on Thingiverse from bits that I found in Tinkercad and bits that I drew myself. Because once we've done that and printed it off we have a pile of plastic parts. Now to put this model together you'll need to print the parts and you'll need four axles. The 6mm bar 100mm long and this one is 120mm long and you'll need some bearings. These are 12mm on the outside, 6mm on the inside obviously and 4mm thick. Take the frame and just stuff the bearings in all those large holes like that just by press fitting them in and then what we need to do is fit an axle and on the axle stick the wheels apart from the rear axle where you take the smaller thicker of those cogs and put those cogs onto the rear axle. There you go, now it's modelled after a lunar buggy which is kind of cool. There's the wheels on it. Notice I put that cog on there. What we need to do now is put these two on which is the bevel cog and the engaging cog so that the bevel cog goes there, that cog goes there. Now it doesn't really matter which way around you get these to be honest as long as that cog clears the ground. We put the axle through there and engage those cogs. So now we've got the two drive gears in place and the bevel gear here. If we turn the bevel gear, of course the wheels turn and what we need to do is be able to turn that bevel gear and for that we've got another bevel gear that goes there and this is a Savonius wind turbine goes on the top there so run an axle through those. Okay, there it is finished and we've moved that obviously then the rotor turns equally if we turn the rotor it'll move the vehicle. <laughs> It's a ridiculous thing, isn't it? But sometimes you've just got to have fun. Okay, let's put a hairdryer on it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, that's just a bit of fun, but velomobiles were a realistic proposition. In a velomobile, you have a propeller and use the engine to drive the propeller and the push of the propeller to drive the vehicle. Here, of course, we're driving this rotor with the wind and connecting that straight to the wheels, but it does raise that question. Is it possible to put a turbine on a car, charge a battery and then use an electric car from the battery that you've charged from the wind? Well surprisingly enough the answer to that is yes. And it's yes if you think about how we use cars. Cars on average sit on the drive for 90% of their life. We actually only use them 10% of the time. The rest of the time they're just sitting there. There's a great deal of research going on to put turbines on cars because when they're basically sitting there doing nothing they can use the turbine to charge a set of batteries and there are research groups looking into it. But perhaps one of the most exciting developments is from Dutch inventor Oscar de Kiefer who has put a turbine on the front of his car. It's been designed and it exhausts through the wheels to have next to no additional drag when he's running his car and he uses that turbine to charge a battery and then uses the battery to run an electric motor. Now he has positioned the turbine in the front but he does talk about putting it upright so that it would also be upright when the car is parked. But you've got to admire that haven't you and somebody tells you something can't be done and you say oh yeah well I'm going to do it anyway and then you go and prove people wrong. That's just awesome.
The favoured option is a portable foldable wind turbine like we made in video 1966 that you put on the roof of your car. Now that makes kind of a sense if you think about it because your car roof is about 2 metres by 3 metres and of course a wind turbine 2 metres across an 11 metre per second wind will generate something in the region of 5 kilowatts. If you're running something like a Twizy for example which has an engine that's about 4 kilowatts, 1 hour's parking equals 1 hour's driving. Of course you still do need the wind to charge it but it is a viable option or at least it's being seen as a viable option. So if Oscar's ideas are a bit too wacky for you then certainly a portable wind turbine that just folds up and it's an attachment like a roof rack onto your car could be a way of running and charging an electric vehicle. So Running and charging your electric car or a vehicle from wind power is not as wacky as it might first appear and it is being given serious consideration from driving the car by wind to using wind to drive the car and wind in order to charge an electric car are all options that are being explored right now. So like so many things the idea of water as fuel it's not a new idea. It actually first came out in 1874 with Jules Verne who called water the coal of tomorrow. So water as fuel has been kicking around for ages. But it really came to prominence in the 1970s like so many of these things because of the petrol crisis. There was a fuel crisis. And because of that people were really looking hard at loads of different ways of generating fuel to run stuff like their cars and the water car which ran only on water became very popular then but like everything it has a history now just to clarify a little bit about what a water car is not I mean the first thing it's not water injection so Luke who is our resident petrol head is doing a water injection video over on Welcome to the World of TNT and I've put the link down in the bottom if you want to have a look at that but water injection is about injection, injecting water into the fuel as the fuel enters the carburetor or as the fuel enters the piston. But like I say, Luke does a really good job on that and that is not what is meant by a water car. The other thing that isn't meant is a steam engine. A steam engine obviously takes water, borns the water and it's the expansion of the water that creates the work and that's using water as the working fluid, not as a fuel. And we're also not talking about the hydrogen car, because of course water splits into hydrogen and oxygen, although there is a partial hydrolysis producing something called HHO, which is Brown's gas. That gas is then burnt, and a water car is not meant by that. There's a bit of a crossover point, and we'll talk about that later, but that's a hydrogen car, and of course hydrogen cars are something that are being well researched. Now interestingly enough, only about 4% of the hydrogen that's produced comes from electrolysis of water. The other 96% comes from the cracking of fuels, uh, hydrocarbons. That's where we get most of our hydrogen from. Actually, it's the cracking of methane. So it's not moving away from fossil fuels. And that's because electrolysis of water actually isn't particularly good or particularly efficient. And so we only get 4% of it. So we're not talking about specifically hydrogen cars and hydrogen generation where the hydrogen is external. The other thing is it's not a hydrogen fuel enhancement because you can put hydrogen in the same way you do water injection you can inject hydrogen and fuel into the car together or HHO and get an improvement in fuel economy and in runtime from the um, injection of hydrogen in the same way you can with the injection of water actually. So we're not talking about any of those things when we're talking about a water car. A water car is a car that runs from water. Now there have been a ton of efforts on this and you find an awful lot of newspaper articles, an awful lot of television that's been done on it and of course the internet abounds with various water fuel cars and claims that people have run from Land's End to John and Groats or from Seattle to Tampa only on a litre of water. Now perhaps the most widely reported one was the Garrett Electrolytic Capacitor which came out in 1935 and received an awful lot of attention from the, uh, I think it was the Dallas Morning News, anyway it was in the newspapers. Uh, and there was a patent which showed a carburetor that was an electrolytic chamber 
and electrolyzed the water used as the hydrogen that came off and injected that in. It was back in the 80s when Stan was talking about his dune buggy and that it would run on nothing but water. The problem was Stan gave conflicting ideas about how this thing worked. One was um, it was like a water splitter that took place of your spark plug and it used resonance to spl uh, split the water before it burnt. And then the other one was that there was an electrolyzer hidden in the tank, uh, in the boot and that provided hydrogen for this to work. The problem was, um, Stan gave lots of dev demonstrations, but would let nobody look at it. And of course, in 1996, the Ohio court found him guilty of gross fraud. And that is perhaps a black mark against you. And he dropped dead of an aneurysm in a car park in 1998. And that fueled conspiracy theory that he'd been poisoned and his death was most mysterious. But whatever you think about um, Stan Mayers, there's been a lot of attempts to replicate what it is that he's done and of course mm, they haven't been uh, that successful let's be kind they've been so as you would expect the 80s was rife with this kind of innovation and we covered one in the chlorine car when we looked at running a car on chlorine of course water came up and it kind of died a death after the fuel crisis was over and everybody went back to their normal way of living till sort of like the 2000s or so when you see an awful lot more of hydrogen injection and water splitting cells and I'm thinking here of things like the Joe cell for instance. Now, there was a chap called Dennis Klein and in 2002 he brought out something called the Aquagen and the Aquagen was supposed to work in exactly that way. It took water and somehow it split the water, there was no external energy and this was able to run a car and Klein claimed that he was in negotiation with the US Department of Defense. However a few years later they stepped back from that entire thing and now they uh, promote the Aquagen as a HHO generator as a replacement for oxyacetylene. Also in 2002, Genesis World Energy came out with the device. They actually uh, put it into practice in 2003, where they claimed it would run only from water splitting and be able to run a car. They took, uh, I think it was about two and a half million in investment, and in 2006, the guy who led the company, which was uh, Patrick Kelly, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's the same Patrick Kelly who did Free Energy Devices, that book that circulates around on the internet as a PDF of all the up-to-date free energy devices. Anyway, he was found guilty of fraud in 2006 and spent five years in prison because of that. In 2008, a Japanese company called Genepax came out with a water-fueled car that they claimed ran on a mysterious electrolyte membrane device which used metal hydride created a HHO gas which was burnt in the cylinder. They never really revealed details but went bankrupt in 2009 saying that the, um, the costs of development of the engine were too great and they just closed their doors. Also in 2008 there was a Sri Lankan chap, uh, Thushara Priyamel, and he came out with the water splitting engine where he claimed that he was able to drive across the length and breadth of Sri Lanka in only three litres of water and he got government interest but it all came to nothing when he was arrested for fraud and investment scamming and there's another guy called Daniel Dingle who since I think it's 1969 is a Filipino and was talking about a water splitting car that he'd invented and he managed to convince an investor to invest a large sum of money with him to further develop this device because of course who wouldn't be interested in that unfortunately of course it, he suffered the same fate as a lot of people that he was basically attempting to run a, a scam and he was doing it in the Philippines it's not the greatest place to do it where they'll imprison you if you have a teddy bear full of cocaine even if you don't know it's full of cocaine and he was imprisoned for 20 years for running that scam one important one I want to mention actually is Aga Waha Ahmed. He was a, a Pakistani who in 2012 reckoned that he was running a water car using a water kit. The reason I mention this water kit is because the water kits became um, super important across the internet. Everybody was selling these kits and, and creating electrolyzer bubblers that you could actually add to your car that was supposed to improve the fuel economy. That's 300% or so. Uh, they, they didn't and they sort of died a death but there was a period of time there if you looked on the internet on water car you saw nothing but these bubbler kits and that guy was actually particularly famous for having kicked that off and getting a lot of advertising based on that. But if we leave aside throughout the history of the development of these devices they have really been littered with well 
fraud and pseudoscience. I think the most disappointing thing about them is they are in fact not water for fuel. They're actually electrolyzers. Most of them develop hydrogen or HHO gas from electrolysis of the water or separation of the water by some means and then they burn that resulting gas. And I think that's because of the way we think about fuel. Fuel is something we burn and of course you can't burn water so you have to make it into something you can burn and get water back. But they are hydrogen engines in disguise. They are masquerading as being water when they are in fact hydrogen. And I personally find that quite disappointing because although you can't burn water, you can explode water. Now this is based on the work of um, Peter and Neil Granow in the 1990s. Uh, and it was work published in the Journal of Plasma Physics in 1998 where it applied a high voltage arc across a whole series of experiments and basically shot projectiles into the sky. Now, I did something on this many years ago when I shot tomatoes in the sky. It's based on a cavitation phenomenon. You explode the water and it rushes back in itself and creates a cavitation bubble in pretty much the same way that a boat propeller does and very similar to what the pistol shrimp does. This cavitation that's either formed mechanically or by application of a high voltage arc can generate power. That, to my mind, would be using water as fuel because it's the water that you're actually acting on using high voltage or mechanical means and then that could actually be a fuel. So if people were to explore that, I might be a bit more convinced that we were using the water as a fuel as opposed to converting the water into something else. So if I was asked why haven't we got a water fuel car well, I would answer not because of terrible government conspiracies or buyouts by petrol companies, but quite simply because nobody's been working on one. They've all been working on hydrogen and HHO burners because in our minds the idea is that a fuel must burn. And I suspect if we look, took a bit of a deeper look at Granau and we looked at these anomalous events that happen with high voltage and cavitation in water, we'd move an awful lot more close to a genuine water for fuel car. Anyway, I thought I would share that little potted history and my thoughts with you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please remember to like and subscribe.